Topping the news at 7. Heritage Key teams with cruise tourists as the country welcomes two vessels with passengers for the first time since the pandemic. Probe launched after baby chickens are dumped in a bin outside Liat Cargo in Coolidge. Three men accused of kidnapping Arthur James remanded to prison. And House Speaker Sir Gerald Watt QC responds to concerns from opposition senators. Those stories begin right now. The local evening news is brought to you by Nagico, local agents, Bryson's Insurance. Good evening, you're in tune with the ABS Evening News. Thank you so much for having joined us. My name is Garfield Burford, a warm welcome. And I'm Sequoia Servia. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, today was a momentous day for the country as the recovery of the cruise tourism sector welcomed two cruise vessels for the first time since the start of the pandemic. That's right, Sequoia. Heritage Key teamed with tourists today, providing a major boost for a sector which had been torpedoed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Jessica Russell has our top story. She was at the Key today and has a report. It's a great day for cruise tourism here in Antigua. For the first time since the COVID-19 pandemic, two ships are docked here at Heritage Key. The celebrity Apex and Aida Luna were docked at Heritage Key on Monday, carrying a total of about 3,500 passengers. Tourism Minister Charles Fernandez says it's a positive sign for cruise tourism. It signals the restart of the, in a big way for us, the whole aspect of the cruise industry. This is the first time since the pandemic, uh, almost two years ago, that we've had two big ships at one time. It's also the first time one of the ships has been to the island. The Apex is the inaugural visit here. That's a new ship that's coming, so that also is important for us. Health measures are also in place. Yes, all passengers are vaccinated uh, that are coming off. There are uh, now, I think, there are provisions for persons who are uh, medical reasons not to be vaccinated, in which case they would have to take a test before coming off, but I'm not aware of any of them being approved uh, locally to come off or, or have made an application to come off. The captains of the ships exchanged plaques with the tourism minister during short ceremonies. Captain for Celebrity Apex, Demetrius Cafetsis, says he's happy to be here. Antigua has always been a desired destination for our guests and it gives us great, great pleasure to see that Antigua in a continuous mode progress and improve her facilities offering safe berth to our ships and a safe destination to our guests. Aida Luna captain Volker Baumgart expressed similar sentiments. We are very happy that after all this uh, crisis uh, yes. we are back here. But it was the passengers who appeared to be the happiest to be on the island. Our experience so far is that Antigua is more prepared for tourism than a lot of other islands. Uh, I believe that it's going to make our experience much better. We're comfortable wearing masks, fully vaccinated, so not too worried about anything, just looking to hit the beach. We were here about two years ago, and we did a beach tour and the tour of the island, and it's beautiful, and we are so happy to be back. Following the resumption of cruise tourism in July after a hiatus caused by the pandemic, the port operator says the arrival of two cruise ships is monumental. All the persons who depend on cruise tourism, today marks a very important day. Jessica Russell, ABS News. Thanks, Jessica. So again, reminding you that the country, for the first time since the pandemic, welcoming two cruise vessels with passengers. Major developing story there. Let's stay with that story because cruise tourism stakeholders have welcomed today's developments in St. John's. With those reactions, here again, Jessica Russell. The usual hustle and bustle returned to Heritage Key, with two cruise ships being docked with passengers, the first time since the onset of the pandemic. However, some on the front lines relying directly on tourism say business has been slow. You know, I've been down here all morning, uh, just waiting for my turn, basically. It's uh, people are a little skeptical. They're not, well, riding yet. I guess they're getting their land legs back. Another taxi driver is hoping for things to pick up for the rest of the season. It's a good showing that um, we have passenger arrival coming back in the key and hopefully it can improve, especially today. Yeah, I guess on the floor, there is some work, but minimal. 
This representative for a shipping agency is pleased with the sector's outlook. It's a really promising season and we're just uh, so happy to see them here and basically we're just overjoyed. An entertainer says with tourists coming in at the pier, he's hoping to head back out to work. I, I used to be down here entertaining with my banjo, but I haven't returned back as yet. But I'll be down here soon to entertain the tourists with my banjo. This business operator is happy to see more tourists back in the area. We do have uh, two cruise ships out there. I mean, they're big. So things are looking more positive where you see all the people walking around. Meanwhile, Tourism Minister Charles Fernandez says more will benefit from cruise tourism with visitors having more freedom to move around. We have now worked out protocols whereby because we have uh, mandated that uh, all of our frontline tourism uh, workers be vaccinated, including myself, by the way, that the, uh, the tourists also being vaccinated tremendously reduces the whole aspect of transmission from visitor to local. Jessica Russell, ABS News. We continue to monitor the ongoing mega redevelopment of the cargo port at Deepwater Harbor being bankrolled by a U.S. $90 million loan from the People's Republic of China. Ongoing dredging work as part of the project will enable the port to accommodate larger cargo vessels. Port manager Darwin Telemax says it's a game changer since not only is the harbor being made deeper, but the channel will also be widened. The channel was 90 meters wide. Uh, that means it was 45 meters on either side of the center. Uh, we're now making it 70 meters on either side of the center. So we're going from 90 to 140 meters wide. And the channel was 10.5 meters deep. We're making it 12.3 meters deep. The port manager notes it's a significant step in the redevelopment of the facility. What that means is we can take sh container ships uh, that would be considered Panamax ships, larger ships, ships that can bring in... What that means is we can take sh container ships uh, that would be considered Panamax ships, larger ships, ships that can bring in well over 2,000 or 3,000 containers can now come into Antigua. We've never seen anything like that. One day we will, because we can operate there. To do so, Telemax says the right equipment is required on the shore side, and a part of his trip to the UK meetings is to find partners to assist in those areas. Well, to another developing story now, several boxes of mostly dead baby chickens were dumped in a bin outside Liat Cargo in Coolidge today. Authorities from the National Solid Waste Management Authority, the NSWMA, have begun investigations into who is behind this act. A report from Jamie J. Roche. Flies swarm boxes of baby chicks near a bin outside Liat Cargo in Coolidge Monday. There's a control and prevention coordinator, Dion Gordon, is part of a team investigating an illegal dumping report. So we have not counted all the boxes, but basically one of the boxes indicated to us there were about 20 boxes that came in with chicken. And uh, as I said, our investigation is still ongoing. Gordon says based on the investigations, unauthorized individuals have dumped waste in and around the bin, which is for business waste from Liat Quick Pack. We are encouraging the public that if you are not sure of how to dispose your waste, we're asking you to call National Solid Waste at 562-1347. says people can also call 727-2467 or visit the landfill for information. Meanwhile, Gordon says her team will work closely with the Ministry of Agriculture as they continue their probe. She's appealing to anyone with information about the incident to contact the National Solid Waste Management Authority. Jamie J. Roche, ABS News. In other news, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, continues to mutate. The World Health Organization says it's tracking four variants of concern, with the Delta variant being the most dominant. So we are tracking more than 20 sublineages of Delta, which means Delta plus additional mutations. But essentially, uh, what we're looking at is how Delta is changing over time. The United Nations Health Agency's technical lead on COVID-19, Dr. Maria von Kirchhoff, says a form of the Delta variant was identified in Europe. One of the sublineages that we're looking at is this AY, um, it's AY.4.2, um, and it basically means Delta with additional mutations. Um, and that is something that was identified in the UK, um, and they've shared information with us. 
However, the assurance has been provided that vaccines still work. The good news is that even though Delta is dominant, um, our vaccines remain incredibly effective against preventing severe disease and death. Now, Ryan Johnson is the latest attorney to be called to the bar in Antigua and Barbuda. Johnson is no stranger to le the legal fraternity, having worked in the legal affairs department for several years. With that story, here is Jamie J. Roche. Ryan Lenwood Johnson describes law as a noble profession. He says he was about seven or eight years old when he decided he would become a lawyer to help people. Yes, you can earn a good living, but you can also seek to assist people who are in need. And uh, of course, uh, I think I would, was influenced by my stepfather, who is an attorney, and my father, who is an attorney as well. Johnson's stepfather is Solicitor General Martin Camacho, and his father is Bar Association President Lenwood Johnson. Camacho recalls a young Ryan asking to work with him at his office. He was interning at 11 years old. I mean, he had this interest. I mean, I never forced him. He just wanted to be there. The older Johnson says he's extremely proud of his son's achievement. I certainly look for um, great things from Ryan. And I, as I said in court, maybe I shouldn't, no pressure, but I expect him to, be, to do greater things than I have achieved at, in my um, time at the bar. Johnson's mother, Trilda Camacho, is also elated. I've been with him on his, this journey, and I will be with him always. It's just amazing. I'm just happy. Very, very happy. Attorney General the Honorable Stedward Benjamin, who Johnson calls a father figure, is also credited for playing a significant role in his personal growth. The new attorney, who holds a master's degree in legal drafting, says he will continue working with the Legal Affairs Department's legislative drafting team. But he says now he will also assist con counsels in legal cases. Jamie J. Roche, ABS News. The three men police say kidnapped missing man Arthur James are not on remand at Her Majesty's prison. Liberta residents Uri Joseph, Zamir Ogaro, and Abassi Ogaro had their first court appearance at the District B Magistrate Court Monday morning. Their attorney, Wendell Robinson, told the court he would not yet apply for bail since prosecutors indicated they would oppose the application based on the seriousness of the offense and ongoing investigations of other pending matters. Police charged the trio with James's kidnapping last Friday. James, a Grace Farm resident, disappeared two Thursdays ago. His family members filed a missing persons report two days later, and investigators have since found his mobile phone near Freetown Village. Police are appealing to anyone with information to contact the Criminal Investigations Department at 462-3913 or call Crime Stoppers at 800 TIPS, that's 800-8477. We'll of course update you as the case continues. Now there is a fresh concern about the failure of the United States to comply with a 16-year ruling to compensate Antigua and Barbuda following an internet gaming dispute or online gaming dispute. The comments are coming from newly appointed OECS ambassador and permanent representative to the United Nations World Trade Organization, Colin Murdoch. Now, Antigua and Barbuda is yet to see a cent of the over 200 million US dollars from the 2005 landmark ruling. With our update this evening, here is Ursula Charles Jr. Ambassador Colin Murdoch, who has recently commenced his new role as the OECS ambassador and a permanent representative to the United Nations World Trade Organization, he says the reputation of the United States in international trade matters has been severely dented. And we are trying to persuade them that uh, the fact that this case is so long outstanding is in fact damaging to the United States reputation because the United States likes to preach that um, you, know, you must adhere to international rules and regulations and international law must be upheld and so on. And then here they are with uh, a judgment that is so long outstanding. The former senior advisor to the Prime Minister observes the delay has also severely affected the perceived potency of the World Trade Organization. It also undermines the legitimacy of the WTO itself. Because at the end of the day, this is a decision by the Dispute Settlement Board of the WTO. And the fact that it has gone so long without settlement I think is damaging to the reputation and the legitimacy of the WTO itself. But while commenting, the changes in political administration have slowed the payout of some 21 million US dollars annually in losses and damages. 
Ambassador Murdoch assures the issue will be firmly back on the table following his recent appointment. It's still under discussion. Um, it has recently been reactivated. And there are discussions going on right now between the United States Trade Representative and the government of Antigua and Barbuda. And some of these discussions are taking place in Washington, uh, where the USTR is based. So over the years, I think we have had a bit of on and off uh, and stop and go uh, discussions with the United States, which have led to long delays and certain uh, misunderstandings and disagreements. Antigua's trade losses had amounted to more than $200 million, and although the WTO awarded the Twin Island state the right to use trade sanctions to recoup its losses, Antigua Barbuda had opted for a settlement. For ABS News, I'm Ursula Charles, Jr. Now in this developing story at this hour, House Speaker Sir Gerald Watt Queen's Council has issued a response after the absence of opposition senators from the last sitting of Parliament's upper house. Five opposition senators had written to Senate President Alincia Williams-Grant to raise concern over Sir Gerald's insistence that no unvaccinated member will be allowed to sit in Parliament. Among the concerns of the senators is that Sir Gerald ought not to be issuing directives to members of the Senate since the President is responsible for the general direction of the precincts of the Parliament. They also indicate members of Parliament are not public sector employees. Now, there you're looking at some images from the last sitting of Parliament's Upper House on the 29th of October, as you're seeing their empty, empty seats where the opposition would have normally sat. Now, for the very latest, we're joined uh, by House Speaker Sir Gerald Watt QC joining us on Zoom this evening. Thank you so much, Sir Gerald, for joining us. Uh, let's uh, get at this, starting with this question. Your response generally to the concerns of the opposition members? Well, <clears throat> first of all, I... I was uh, surprised that there would be that reaction to what I thought was a very sensible um, policy and protocol to put in place. Bear in mind that we had had a spike, a spike in the in the amount of COVID uh, deaths, uh, COVID um, illnesses, and. <clears throat> In the parliament at any given time, when there's a sitting of the house or the Senate, you can have, I would imagine, about 50 persons in and around the precincts. You have the members of parliament and the members of the Senate. You have the police officers. You have the security people. You have the staff. You have the press. And you have other people, you have the cooks, and you have persons who are come in and visit and listen to the to the debates. So that I felt that it would it would be a, a wise thing to create the bubble, in other words, to ensure that everybody that sat in the house and in the Senate, together with the staff of the would be vaccinated because all the, the, the staff and members in the parliament, not members, the staff, are in fact vaccinated. And uh, the reaction was quite surprising, uh, particularly when one considers that this is parliament that makes laws and parliament, while this is not a law, parliament should be doing everything to assist the public in getting over this dreadful pandemic. And that was my reason. My also reason is, which I will show you and discuss with you, is that I had every legal right to do so. And I did it for the good of the country, for the good of the parliament, and because I think it is the right thing to do. Thank you so much, Sir Gerald. And what about the argument that is the Senate president who has authority for affairs of the parliament? That is absolutely not so. Uh, the quote, uh, the, the signatories to this letter quoted uh, Standing Order 91 of the Senate Standing Orders, which says that the president is uh, in charge of the precincts of the parliament, whatever they, I don't have my letter in, in there. The fact is that standing order 97 in the house says the very same thing. 
So tell me, if the Senate, if, if the, the, the president is in charge of the precincts, overall precincts of parliament, what is the position with the House? Because Standing Order 97 says the same thing. No, the reason is that whoever advised them or they have advised themselves, the interpretation that they have given is a, a real a layman's interpretation. They look at it and they say, ah, the president is 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 obviously um, he can't give any 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 instructions because it's, it's the president. Well, that is not so. None of those standing orders, first of all, the standing orders have to be interpreted to mean a direct in charge of the direction of the Senate when the Senate is sitting. And likewise, in the House, uh, standing order SO 97, when the House is sitting. But the overall administration of Parliament is clearly the Speaker. That is so in the entire uh, in the entire Commonwealth. That is obvious. It has never been the, the Senate. So they have been bad, ill-advised, or they have ill-advised themselves. If you look at the letter that you have, perhaps, Mr. Burford, you will note that they also made the point that they were the um, they are not uh, public servants. Well, I never said that they were public servants. I didn't give them a mandate because of the public servant. What I have told them in the letter is that if you look at the parliamentary procedure and learning in Canada, and I chose Canada because it is one of the, the it is a, a Commonwealth country, and it has a bicameral Senate, uh, parliament, it has a House, and it has a Senate. So I chose that. And I'm sorry, I don't have the letter. You may have it, and perhaps you'd read it. I'm sorry, I rushed out of the office and I didn't bring it. It says that it is the speaker that is in charge of the administration of parliament and all the precincts and the assets. There you and are. I quote... Yes, you, you, yes. you actually quoted uh, practice 2009, second edition, uh, which says that uh, the speaker is the head of the House of Commons administration and, is, and is, is responsible for its overall direction and management. That's from the uh, bicameral legislature in, in Canada. Uh, so, Gerald, we're pretty much out of time. Just another one minute to go on this one. Let me just ask you, what do you figure is the way forward now on this? What would, you, what would be your message to the opposition senators who wrote that letter to the Senate president expressing some concerns? What happens? No. I would presume that they would educate themselves as to what the, the, the parliamentary procedure and practice is, and uh, that they would, would uh, change their minds and come in because it is proved that what they're saying, the reasons that they have given, are not correct. No. But if you look at my letter, Really, the problem in, the, in my view, I'm saying this openly, it was a cynical political ploy to protect a senator who apparently is unvaccinated. So consequently, if he had come, if, if they had come to parliament, uh, to the Senate on that day, he would not have been able to pre pre present a, a, a vaccination ID or certificate. And I believe that is why they have stayed out. I will just simply say this. The rule that I've made, if they think I'm wrong, do something about it. But as long as I'm following the law and the, rule and, and the parliamentary practice the, uh, in all Western Commonwealth countries with a bicameral settlement, it, it will stay in place. The protocol is in place. And if they don't want to wish to come, well, that's out of my hands. But if you don't do your work, don't expect to get paid. That's my view, but I, I'm, not in, I'm not in charge of that. And right. that is what they, they should get into the house and do the work that they have been appointed to do. They, all the members of the house have complied. What's it with these opposition senators? All right. I know for sure that um, um, me, me, um, the member for Barbuda, I saw him get vaccinated. I know he's vaccinated. He presented his certificate. So what's, what's with them? 
matter for them. If they don't wish to come into the Senate, then they must know what they, I think you have to ask them, what is the future for them? They will not be coming into the parliament as long as I am speaker and that protocol is in place. It will not be in place forever, but as long as it is in place, until I feel that with advice that it is careful, that it is okay for now, fine. That's my position. All right, so Gerald, thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, a very, very blunt with your perspective on it and your reactions. Really appreciate it, and uh, certainly we'll follow this story very closely. Thank you so much, Sir Gerald. That was very blunt. Mm. All right, thank <laughs> you so much. Sir Gerald Watt, QC, is Speaker of the House. When we come out, more of the national stories that we're tracking for you this evening, including this one. Liet applies to commence charters to St. Croix. And we'll tell you about uh, that story, and of course, uh, and a whole lot more coming up on the ABS Evening News on air and online. Do stay with us, please. At Nagico, the things that matter to you matter to us. Like your boat when you're at sea and you get away from everything. Your home and the security of your daughter's things. And the car that you've had for too long. But after all these years, you just can't let go. At Nagico, we're about much more than just insurance. We're about the big things and the small things that mean everything. Paint it light, uplift your spirit. Call us to change your world. This Christmas, we all want comfort and to reconnect, and Harris is right there to help. So create that special Christmas feel this holiday with 10% off select Harris paints and accessories. Shop now and get all the Christmas feels this year with Harris paints. Promotion ends December 31st. Lucasade Energy. Lucasade has two delicious new flavors, but only one can stay. Team Citrus Chill. Team Berry Crush. Vote now on Instagram or Facebook by uploading a video or picture of your favorite flavor and tagging Lucasade. It's up to you which flavor stays. There are over 500 prizes to be won. See press and social media for details. Lucasade, taste the energy. Townhouse Mega Store Bogo Elbow Sale is back, and it's bigger and better than ever. Most items in the store are Bogo Elbow. Oh. Buy an item, get the other item at equal or lesser value for fifty percent off. Housewares, small and large appliances, furniture, and many, many more. Most items? Yes, most items. Some items have really low, low specials. Great quality items at unbelievably low prices. And remember, the more you buy, the greater your chance to buy Since Ghost and Saturday, November 13th, Townhouse Megastore, your home superstore. Hello and welcome back. Antigua-based regional airline Liette is considering an additional avenue into the United States Virgin Islands, even as it works toward the resumption of scheduled flights into St. Thomas. Sherilyn Beezer has the latest on the discussions regarding St. Croix. We are also looking at probably doing one or two charters to St. Croix as well. We have already made the application to the FAA for that, and if we could do it, then we certainly shall. Director of Flight Operations, Captain Arthur Senhaus, says the airline is hoping for a positive response. Even if it's two charters for December to get these families across, and once we can get people into Antigua, then we can connect them to the rest of our network. Meanwhile, a tentative date has been set for the resumption of flights into St. Thomas. The projected start date that we have in mind that we're working diligently towards is the 21st of November this year. Right, it will be on a Sunday, and we're planning to do one flight every week into St. Thomas, Antigua, St. Thomas, Antigua. Captain Senhaus says weekly flights will be on Sundays. Well, we are closing up some loose ends with our maintenance program to ensure that we could fully support the service once we put it on stream. 
And that's one of the key factors that's governing the, um, the decision that we've made. The director of flight operations explains the airfare being considered. But it's more to get people who have longed to travel between Antigua and the Virgin Islands, the U.S. Virgin Islands, to do so. So initially, it would be um, a fairly reduced fare. St. Thomas will become the carrier's 10th destination since returning to the skies in November 2020. The entity was rescued from the brink of liquidation through the efforts of the Gaston Brown administration and is now under the direction of a court-appointed administrator. Sherilyn Visa reporting for ABS News. Thank you so much, Sherilyn. When we come back from this break, we'll turn our attention to news overseas. One of the stories that we're tracking for you very closely, over 72% of the adult population in St. Kitts and Nevis now fully vaccinated against COVID-19. We'll give you an update from the Twin Island Federation. And in international news, airline CEOs react as U.S. reopens its borders to double-jabbed foreign visitors. Those stories still ahead for us on the ABS Evening News on air and online. Please do stay with us.